Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. In this episode, we will delve into the topic of post-war reconstruction. It's a complex and multifaceted process that encompasses not only infrastructure and housing reconstruction, but also social and economic recovery. We will analyze various aspects of reconstruction, including examining factors that facilitate or hinder this process. We'll explore the priorities facing the country during the recovery period and shed light on questions regarding the allocation of resources, time, and financial means required for it. Finally, we'll ponder the essence of fair national recovery. Let me begin with a brief overview of the damage incurred. As of October 2023, the estimated damage inflicted upon Ukraine's infrastructure due to the full-scale invasion by the Russian Federation amounted to $152 billion, as reported by Ukrainian economists. Since then, the damage has escalated, with the Russian army bombarding hundreds of Ukrainian cities and villages on a daily basis. The invasion has pushed 7 million people into poverty and set back development progress by 15 years. Residential buildings suffered the most. The losses to the housing sector are estimated at $56 billion, with over a tenth of all homes in the country destroyed or damaged, amounting to hundreds of thousands of private and multi-story houses. Infrastructure ranks second in terms of damage, having incurred a loss of $37 billion. The losses to enterprises and industry come third, estimated at $11 billion. The education sector has also been severely affected, with damages totaling $10 billion. Over 1,700 school buildings, over 1,000 kindergartens, and nearly 600 university-related facilities have been damaged or destroyed. Losses in the healthcare sector continue to mount. A total of 1,223 medical institutions, hospitals and clinics have been destroyed or damaged as a result of the war. The colossal resources required for reconstruction and rehabilitation are staggering. By the end of 2023, the World Bank estimated Ukraine's reconstruction needs at no less than $486 billion over the next decade. This figure is nearly three times Ukraine's GDP for 2022. It surpasses previous estimates from a year prior, which pegged the renewal needs at $411 billion. Throughout the first two years of the war, much discussion revolved around post-war reconstruction. As the conflict dragged on and the prospects of its conclusion appeared increasingly uncertain, the discourse shifted. Now discussions about reconstruction are more frequently divorced from the context of the war's end. This is because prolonged warfare necessitates immediate action in reconstructing vital infrastructure without delay to ensure the economy continues functioning. If a country maintains functioning electricity, heating, roads and railways, the basic needs of the population can be met and the economy continues to function, providing tax revenue to the state. Therefore, it is crucial to restore key infrastructure as soon as it is destroyed. Of course, the situation is somewhat different in occupied territories, but for the rest of the country, recovery is paramount at this moment. Partial recovery is made possible in large part due to the support of international partners. In early 2024, the European Union approved the allocation of 50 billion euros to Ukraine under the Ukraine Facility Program. It envisions funding being provided over the next four years, not only for reconstruction but also for ensuring macro-financial stability. However, as we can see, these funds represent only a fraction of the damage inflicted by the war. Given the uncertain situation regarding US aid allocation, this presents a significant challenge. To implement reconstruction and recovery programs, the government decided to concentrate resources and authority in a small number of state bodies. Before the onset of the large-scale war, the Ministry of Infrastructure was responsible for construction in the country. It was on this basis that an institution responsible for the reconstruction of Ukraine was created. For this purpose, the Ministry of Infrastructure was merged with the Ministry of Community and Territory Development. 
it was anticipated that this move would streamline decision-making for reconstruction. The creation of the Ministry for Communities, Territories and Infrastructure Development aimed to enhance coordination in assessing the extent of damage and reconstruction requirements, while also taking the lead in formulating recovery policies. The State Agency for Reconstruction and Infrastructure Development became the government body responsible for the direct implementation of reconstruction projects. Essentially, it is a renamed State Road Agency of Ukraine, to which the State Agency for Infrastructure Projects was added. The newly created ministry also received powers in the field of energy efficiency, which were previously vested in the Ministry of Energy. Ukrainian commentators noted that the excessive concentration of powers in the newly created combined ministry could be detrimental. The ministry now has many powers and finances concentrated within it, given that huge funds will pass through it. Concentration of resources within one structure creates ample opportunities for abuse, especially since large infrastructure projects are usually associated with corruption and violations of antitrust legislation. We can recall the history of the so-called Big Construction, one of Ukraine's major infrastructure programs prior to the invasion. Its goal was declared to improve transportation, education, social and sports infrastructure. The program began implementation in 2020, and initially there were many competing contractor companies involved. Ukrainian commentators wrote that soon the situation degraded into a cartel collusion of a few market players, who received almost all the orders. As a result, construction costs began to rise. And although it cannot be unequivocally stated that the concentration of powers in the combined ministry will necessarily lead to a sharp increase in corruption, concentration creates prerequisites for corruption. Executive powers mean nothing without resources for their implementation. In September 2022, Parliament addressed this issue by establishing the Fund for Elimination of the Consequences of Armed Aggression. It is the government that decides on the allocation of state funds for recovery, however not independently, but in coordination with the Parliamentary Budget Committee. Such a procedure should increase parliamentary control over the use of financial resources. The hitch may be that the Constitution of Ukraine does not allow parliamentary committees to have any independent powers. In 2023, the state budget allocated $1 billion for the elimination of the consequences of armed aggression. The government also approved the procedure for the distribution of these funds. Money was allocated for the construction or acquisition of housing instead of destroyed ones, the restoration of public buildings and critical infrastructure, as well as the purchase of transportation for the needs of schools, hospitals and municipal services. The use of funds raises questions due to complex eligibility criteria. To qualify, certain conditions must be met. Funds are provided only for state or municipal property, only for war-affected areas included in regional recovery and development plans, and for objects maintained in proper condition after restoration. The cost per square meter of reimbursed housing cannot exceed the average housing construction price in the corresponding region. This process will take a lot of time, involve many bureaucratic procedures, and require serious efforts from local authorities to obtain funds. To access the funds, it is necessary to apply to ministries related to the direction, which contradicts the logic of decentralization of power and may complicate the process. Additionally, the majority of the affected property belongs to territorial communities. Therefore, it would be more logical for city or village councils, with their own executive bodies and the ability to prepare necessary documents, to initiate the process rather than regional administrations. After all, the latter currently lack both property and managerial capacity to deal with these issues. Despite the steps taken towards reconstruction, questions remain about the feasibility of creating a large ministry, the potential for increased corruption due to the concentration of powers and resources, and the fair distribution of very limited resources between central authorities and territorial communities. One of the complex issues remains the problem of the workforce. The Ukrainian government estimates that due to the war and migration abroad, the country will need to attract at least an additional four and a half million people for recovery. Ukraine intends to encourage citizens who have left to return home. 
This is important because the more people participate in the recovery process, the faster the country will return to normal. The government is not currently considering attracting labor from other countries and hopes to motivate Ukrainians to return. About 6 million Ukrainians are abroad due to the Russian invasion, mostly in Poland and Germany. Among them are many women between the ages of 35 and 49 and children. Up to 3 to 4 million people may remain abroad, depending on developments. Sociological surveys of Ukrainian refugees show that the majority would like to return. But for this, they need three things. Security, housing and jobs. As for security, the government is already working on demining projects. The goal is to return 80% of potentially mined land to use within 10 years. Grants for retraining have also been issued for 16,000 people, totaling about $5 million. The non-return of Ukrainians will seriously affect the country's economy, leading to a loss of GDP ranging from 2.7% to 6.9% annually. Perhaps the greatest shortcoming of the ongoing reconstruction process is the lack of broad public discussion. It is crucial for society to have a clear understanding of the government's actual capabilities to rebuild what has been destroyed. Additionally, it is important to engage in dialogue with the people about the country's development priorities as a whole. Therefore, the authorities not only face suspicions of misconduct, but also risk openly disappointing Ukrainians. Hence, before initiating the reconstruction process, it would be advisable to thoroughly discuss everything with the people and only then take action. In a class-based society, where the opportunities and resources of different social groups are unequal, it would be naive to expect open and democratic discussions of the needs of the majority of people. Despite declarations that the people are the main clients of the country's recovery, Ukrainian society, like all post-Soviet countries, has a system of patronage relations where power and influence are concentrated in the hands of oligarchs and elites, creating dominant structures. If these structures are interested in maintaining their influence and control, they may use their influence to direct funds to projects that benefit themselves rather than society as a whole. This could lead to inefficient use of resources and slow down the recovery process. It could also create obstacles to transparency and fairness. If decisions on resource allocation and strategic decision-making are made based on the interests of narrow elite groups, it could lead to corruption, opaque deals and violations of competition rules. The war has once again shown that Ukraine needs to regain its status as a developed technological country for survival. This requires comprehensive reforms in various areas of society's life. The country requires a state policy to bolster science, innovation and industry, along with enhancing the quality of education and personnel training. Furthermore, infrastructure and logistics must be improved. The development of high-tech and innovative industries such as information and communication technologies, biotechnology, nanotechnology, the space industry, alternative energy, medicine and pharmaceuticals will help diversify the economy and expand the export palette. Against the backdrop of a global climate emergency, rational use of natural resources is important, based on the introduction of modern technologies, increased energy efficiency, compliance with environmental standards, and the development of a green economy. Social responsibility and solidarity are also needed, based on providing social protection and support for the population, reducing poverty and inequality, improving the standard of living and welfare of citizens, developing civil society and democratic institutions. Another fundamental difficulty is that the task of reconstructing and reforming the country in the interests of the majority of the population contradicts the dominant neoliberal agenda in the government. In the first six months of the major war, there may have been a feeling that in the new, tragic circumstances, the leadership of Ukraine could abandon the neoliberal dogmas it blindly followed in the past. This assumption was prompted by the experience of resisting Russian aggression, in which state-owned enterprises played a key role in the country's survival. Consider Ukrainian railways as an example. 
Despite several privatization efforts, this transportation monopoly remained under government control. Railways have played a vital role, not just in evacuating masses of people, but also in distributing humanitarian aid, equipment and weapons, which were essential for effectively countering the Russian occupation army. It's no surprise that the Russian Federation, in an effort to disrupt Ukrainian logistics, consistently targeted electric substations powering the railways. Another noteworthy shift in paradigm is the nationalization of assets owned by specific Ukrainian and Russian oligarchs. Since the onset of the invasion, various banks and companies owned by Russian individuals have been seized or taken under state control. Similarly, certain Ukrainian oligarchs have seen their control over enterprises diminish as the government takes a firmer stance in safeguarding state interests. Furthermore, strategic enterprises in sectors like oil refining, aviation and engineering have been brought under state ownership in the interest of national security. Despite the war, the government is not rushing to abandon neoliberal ideologies. The mentioned nationalizations and confiscations are explained by the logic of a state of emergency, necessary in a situation of existential challenge for the nation, while neoliberal principles remain a priority. For example, a high-ranking official from the office of the president overseeing the country's economy emphasized in the summer of 2023 that, I quote, the state will no longer perform a socialist function. In particular, he clarified that the government will not be distributing housing and apartments to people who have lost them during the war, nor will it be rebuilding exactly what was destroyed. Instead, a principle similar to the monetization of social benefits will be implemented, where instead of receiving a social good, a person receives money as compensation. For example, for lost housing, the government provides compensation in the form of subsidized mortgages. It is assumed that in this way, people get the opportunity to purchase housing of their choice, where they want. The government is well aware that the restoration of social humanitarian infrastructure and housing is a fundamental condition for people's return. They also understand that in most cases, the role of the state is crucial in recovery programs. The prevailing narrative still emphasizes budget cuts, especially given the necessity to fund extensive defense spending. Take, for instance, the approach to rural schools, where authorities aim to persist with their previous strategy of what's termed optimization, essentially reducing the number of primary educational facilities. The rationale behind this is the declining population in rural areas, juxtaposed with the population growth in urban centers, leading to a shortage of schools there. The government's idea is to build new schools not where they were destroyed, but where people migrated, and where there is a shortage of schools. Similar logic is expected to be applied to the network of hospitals or other humanitarian infrastructure. Another illustration of the ideological orientation of the ruling cabinet can be found in documents describing the nature of future recovery. In the Ministry of Economy, there is an advisory council on economic policy, which includes famous international economists. The council's task is to provide recommendations on recovery policy. The council prepared a study called Post-War Macroeconomic Architecture of Ukraine. The key recommendations of this document repeat the notorious principles of neoliberal policy. Among other things, they advise focusing on the privatization of state-owned enterprises. Acknowledging that the privatization of the 1990s was unsuccessful, the authors note that it is crucial for post-war privatization to be fair, transparent and efficient. To achieve this, it is proposed to start preparing for post-war privatization in advance, even during the war. In the labor market, the authors of the document again consider the outdated labor code as a problem which, in their opinion, contributes to imbalance and lack of flexibility in the labor market. For example, it only allows overtime work in rare cases. The authors propose to introduce more flexible forms of employment together with more targeted social support. The development of more targeted support may mean a reduction in state social support programs and a transition to more limited assistance. This includes what is known in post-Soviet states as the monetization of benefits, where instead of providing a wide range of social benefits, a limited number of needy individuals receive their monetary equivalent. 
Typically, implementing such an approach sharply reduces the number of recipients of social benefits and subsidies. Another recommendation is the consolidation of government services. This likely entails reducing bureaucracy and diminishing the state's role in service provision. Also mentioned is pension system reform, which may involve transitioning to a pension saving system. This refers to redistributing responsibility for pension provision from the state to individual citizens. The authors caution against credit interventions, which should be understood as refraining from using state funds to stimulate the economy through lending and subsidies. While these reforms may result in reduced security and increased uncertainty for the average citizen, additional guarantees are proposed to attract private investments, such as insurance against military risks and public-private partnerships. Even the economists who authored this report believe that the Ukrainian government should aim for debt restructuring or even substantial debt write-offs. They argue that this would free up resources for recovery and fulfilling essential state functions. As a first step in the debt restructuring process, expanding the moratorium on interest and amortization payments is suggested. This makes sense, as of the beginning of 2024, Ukraine's debt to the IMF alone is nearly $12 billion. The effective interest rate for this debt is 7% per annum. Debts to the IMF represent only a small portion of Ukraine's national debt. It is projected that by 2025, the Ukrainian government's obligations will exceed 100% of GDP. Although just two years ago, its size was less than 50% of the economy. Currently, Ukraine's external debt already exceeds $100 billion. The reason lies not only in the sharp increase in debt itself, but also in the significant contraction of the economy due to the invasion. It seems that the Ukrainian government is not showing enough initiative to write off debt, even though the country is in a situation of international force majeure due to war, occupation, economic destruction, and loss of demographic potential. After all, a huge debt will divert essential budgetary resources to its servicing. If the situation does not change, in the future, the country will spend twice as much on interest payments as on healthcare or education. This will cast doubt on spending for stimulating the economy and critical infrastructure. In other words, such a debt burden will undermine internal purchasing power and capital investments in the economy. The problem is that the government readily follows recommendations for labor market liberalization and reducing the state's social obligations, but says nothing about the prospects of writing off external debt. The only action taken in connection with the invasion is a deferral of payments on debts to international financial organizations and foreign governments. Payments on eurobonds were also deferred for two years. However, the issue of debt write-off has not been discussed, although it is vital for the Ukrainian government to take such an initiative. The government is also being urged towards economic liberalization by its allies. In 2023, the White House published a public letter to the Ukrainian authorities, listing the reforms that need to be implemented to continue receiving financial and military assistance. Among the list of reforms were changes in the energy sector, liberalization of gas and electricity tariffs. In other words, this means that the Ukrainian population will have to pay more for essential utilities. A specific deadline of 12 months has been set for this measure to be implemented by September 2024. Let's now turn our attention back to the current realities. The war rages on, and attacks by Russian forces on civilian infrastructure not only persist, but often intensify. In such conditions, reconstruction, if possible at all, is at best partial. For instance, constant attempts by Russians to undermine Ukraine's energy-generating facilities serve as evidence of this. Russia carried out a deliberate campaign of extensive bombing during the autumn and winter of 2022 to 2023. A year later, the attacks continued. At the beginning of 2024, strikes were targeting power plants and substations predominantly in industrial areas of central Ukraine. These attacks primarily aim to cripple the energy generating capacities that power the industrial complex. This indicates a concerted plan by the command of the Russian armed forces to undermine the industrial potential of Ukraine's central regions. 
which following Russia's occupation of significant parts of the Donbas, remain the most industrially developed in the country. It is precisely in central Ukraine, where some of the world's largest iron ore deposits are located, which were one of Ukraine's main export commodities before the war. Exports have significantly declined due to port blockades since the beginning of the Russian invasion. However, since December of last year, when Ukraine effectively restored navigation to its ports, ore sales abroad have begun to rise again. Currently, their revenue constitutes a significant portion of the total foreign currency earnings, which is an important factor given the challenges with interruptions in financial assistance from allies. Ukrainian authorities have recently been focusing on developing their own military industrial complex. This appears to be a logical step amidst decreasing rates and volumes of arms deliveries from the US and European countries. It is evident that the Russian leadership seeks to maximally undermine the industrial and export potential of the central regions, particularly through attacks on the energy infrastructure. Moreover, due to the proximity of the front line, missile flight times are shortened, posing difficulties for air defense systems compared to regions farther from the combat zone. In conclusion of this episode, let's briefly recap the main points identified in our review. The Russian invasion of Ukraine continues, with the intensity of hostilities within the country remaining extremely high. Targeted sabotage of infrastructure by Russian forces creates significant challenges for the economy and the population. Reconstruction in this situation, if possible at all, is only partial. Disruptions in aid from allies further complicate the task. Risks also stem from the neoliberal policies that remain a priority and could lead to subpar reconstruction. The government also needs to initiate the write-off of external debt, as otherwise payments on it will hinder reconstruction efforts. This podcast relies on credible sources, which are detailed in the description. For further reference, you can access the materials through the provided links 